lore of the multiverse, the idea that there are many, maybe an infinite number of universes, uh, when I first heard about it several decades ago, seemed like metaphysics more than physics. Uh, but now it seems that, at least with a lot of my friends, that it's conventional wisdom. Yet there are still some major controversies in the field. Uh, you've dealt with the controversies. Uh, what are some of them? Uh, some of the controversies where the multiverse is concerned is the um, uh, concern that we may never be able to collect evidence for its existence. And um, that, that kind of uh, conclusion is based on general relativity. Uh, that, that says uh, no signal can propagate faster than the speed of light. And the only way for us to, to have direct uh, evidence for an event is by collecting light rays from, from that event. So in that sense, uh, if we can go beyond the horizon of our universe, then it will be hard to know what, what lies beyond. However, uh, there are many indirect uh, ways of, of uh, uh, collecting data and, and um, uh, some of those are recently known as the anomalies in the cosmic microwave background in, in the sky. Uh, those effects are heavily based in, in quantum mechanics and um, uh, one, one of the cherished principles of quantum mechanics is something known as the unitarity principle that simply put says information about the system can never be lost. So in that sense Although our universe might be a small domain in a much vaster and complex cosmos, the multiverse, um, we are entangled, quantum entangled, with, with all the other domains, universes, and whatever else li lies beyond our universe. And, and we can collect data about that entanglement and, and see it in our sky. It's an indirect evidence, it's, it's not a direct observation, but, but yet we, by, by making predictions based on a theory of the multiverse, we, we are able to infer whether there is something out there or not. Also, okay, first of all, let's distinguish two different kinds of multiverses. There are many different yeah. kinds. There's a quantum mechanical kind. I don't want to worry about that now. But uh, one kind of multiverse is what is beyond the so-called light cone that we can see because light has not had a time. So that's part of our own domain, so to speak. We just can't see it because light didn't have time to, to go. The other kind of multiverse is something that is literally squeezed off. It is a, one, of the, one of the implications of inflation theory of the universe, that the universe gets squeezed off and is totally independent. So there's two different kinds of multiverse. There are others, but just these two. So what you're talking about in terms of inferences, which are you talking about? Are you talking about both? Uh, much, much bigger than, than the inflationary uh, domain produced through cosmic inflation early on in the universe. It is true that uh, um, the, the observable universe is only a fraction, a, a smaller part of what was produced, of, of the chunk of space-time produced uh, during inflation in the early universe. Which is our local uh, we, Big Bang, so to speak. And, and our local universe. But, right. but I'm talking about the picture that is much larger okay. of other domains that, that underwent similar evolution okay. like ours, that, that had their own inflation, had their own structure formation, and exist out there. So, so you're saying that there's this uh, grand entanglement uh, absolutely. That yeah. everybody yeah. Is, is, is entangled in this uh, uh, enormous m multiverse because it all yeah. originated from the same kernel, so uh, to speak. There, there are a lot of uh, discussions and, and favorite uh, theories and ideas on how the universe and the multiverse originated, but, but the two are intimately uh, related to one another. And that's a question that goes back to antiquity. Atomists, for example, talked of having many atom universes um, in, in an ensemble, in a pool. Um, and, and then um, uh, later on, in, in, for example, in the 20th century, uh, Hugh Everett, the, a student of John Wheeler, who was studying the implications of quantum mechanics, uh, reached the conclusion that uh, uh, quantum mechanics does not give you just one universe, but, but it gives a family yeah. of wave functions of the universe. But those are very different kinds of, um, of, of universe, of, of a multiverse, than, than an inflationary. The Everett universe is a quantum mechanic yeah. generated which is in, in a totally different um, abstract space, shall we say. Uh, yeah. Whereas the, um, the inflationary universes are within our 
a kind of space. Uh, the very, those are very different kinds of things. Well, in, in, in reality, nobody knows nobody, in, in which space-time this, this universe uh, exists. They, they could right. uh, be embedded in, in, in the same space-time. Yeah, time. of course. One or, can be nested in the other. Or, or they could uh, belong to totally separate space-time. Right. So there, there are many variations, but the idea itself of a multiverse is very old. The reason why uh, on the last 50 to 60 years, and especially on the last decade, it has moved in the realm of physical inquiry rather than philosophy mm. uh, is uh, because we, we are in a position now where we have made sufficient progress with with uh, many questions about our universe and we have come head on with the biggest question of all which is the origin of our universe where did this come from what we see around us and what was there before so that that kind of question naturally leads to to a picture of a multiverse so what are the specific kinds of evidences that you see observationally from which you can infer that there are multiple universes w w which through quantum entanglement are producing the kinds of observations that you think you see. Okay, so I, I can speak about my favorite theory, which is the, the theory I've been working on. And um, in that theory, there is a coherent picture on how our universe was a wave packet before it went through the Big Bang. So it. Uh, we didn't even have a space-time associated with it. And, um, and then later on, of course, it, uh, containing enough energy, it went through a big bang, through cosmic inflation, it grew up, space-time uh, became big as well, and, and, and we end up with the classical universe, the big classical universe we see today. In that picture, since, since I'm using quantum mechanics, something known as quantum cosmology, um, I, I am able to uh, follow through equations, through quantum equations, um, what happens to, to universes such as ours. And, and the uh, conclusion, what we ended up with in, in uh, that case, was a family of, of wave packets, of branches, of the wave function of the universe, that uh, follow a similar story to our universe. Our universe was just one humble member in, in a much vaster pool of possible universes that uh, underwent inflation, grew big, and became classical universes like ours. Since I can follow this picture, I can also calculate uh, quantum entanglement. Now, Normally, in, in quantum theory, one of the big questions is how can you start with a quantum particle or wave form and end up with a classical space-time? That process, quantum to classical transition, is achieved through a mechanism known as decoherence. It, it's basically um, an environment, a bath, in, into which this quantum particle is, is uh, dipped in uh, that, that induces the quantum particle to reveal its classical nature. The, the same story happened in, in the theory that I was studying when, when trying to understand how our universe came into being. So following that decoherence mechanism of all the possible wave functions of the universe, uh, all the way through to present day, when, when these universes are classical universes, not quantum particles anymore, um, comes at the price of accepting that quantum entanglement is always present. That, that, that comes with, with quantum so, mechanics. So again, what are the observations that you see that gives justification to that analysis? So we, we calculated quantum entanglement, and that's how we were able to make predictions. In, in the one universe classical story, the, the universe at inflation will have these quantum wiggles, fluctuations that produce the cosmic microwave background we see today and uh, um, the large scale structure, galaxies, stars, cosmic dust, everything we see around us. If besides that picture that happens locally, our universe is locally inflating, is, if besides that there is also an entanglement with all these other objects, all these other universes out there in the multiverse, then you have a second source of fluctuations that contributes to the cosmic microwave background of, of our sky and the large scale structure of our sky. We calculated that entanglement and how that second source modified the cosmic microwave background and we predicted that there should be, for example, a very large area in the sky, about 10 degrees, that should be nearly empty. Of, of stuff, of, of galaxies, stars, structure, cosmic structure, anything, um, at the redshift of about one. That was observed initially um, about eight months after we made the prediction in 2006, and it was observed uh, through radio astronomy. 
It took a long time for that observation to, to pan out. By now we know, uh, with the Planck satellite data, we know that that region in the sky exists. So that, that was one piece of indirect evidence that there must be something out there that is breaking the uniformity of our sky. We, we expect everything to be spread uniformly in our sky if all we have is one universe. 10 degrees in the sky is a large region. So breaking that kind of uniformity requires something else in the picture. That, that was one such example, but there are three or four anomalies that we observe that cannot be explained with a single universe picture.